Hello and welcome to the Virtualization and Security Cloud Security Podcast, episode number 190 or 200 or something like that. It's a really large number. Um, well, I guess that's large. Today I'm here with Eric Wright at Disco Posse on Twitter and pretty much anywhere else if you can find him there. Eric, you run an organize a, a show or a, con- a contest called Virtual Design Master. Can you tell us a little bit about that and a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me on, Edward. This is always a pleasure. Uh, yes, I'm uh, Disco Posse on Twitter. I write at discoposse.com. I'm the technology evangelist for Turbonomic and do a lot of community-related stuff. Virtual Design Master, uh, it was sort of crafted after the idea of like Ink Master and Kitchen Master. We wanted to create this reality show with a technology element because we kind of see this where you know folks like yourself and other you know virtualization architects and security arch- like people from all over the place are are trying to sort of test the waters on architecture and so we thought why not put them in front of really distinct and fun challenges make it progressive and then ultimately like tap into each of the areas where maybe they're not comfortable so like you know design deploy secure and then actually do you know hardwired orchestration of stuff. It's really really cool, and we've actually just finished up season five. And you know uh, you're you were one of our judges, and you've been a contributor and a supporter throughout, which is really really cool. Uh, TVP Strategy actually was was also a sponsor this year, so huge thanks to you and and the TVP team for for backing us up. Oh my pleasure. Now VDM or Virtual Design Master, you're right. It's a reality show, sort of. It's really interesting is because when I first heard about it, I didn't hear about the backstory. I just heard about the challenges. The backstory is really interesting. And when you start throwing in the backstory and the story around all the challenges to the actual challenges, it really changes how you look at everything. I mean, this is in the future. Yet. When you start thinking about the future, it's like, okay, something happened to the Earth. We've moved to the moon, and from the moon we went to Mars, and then we went from Mars back to Earth several many years later, maybe a decade later. And that whole migration path of humanity is really interesting unto itself. Is now you're starting to talk about interstellar distances. <laughs> you started talking about transmission delays. And it's almost like the, the the design challenges themselves, even though you have this great story, they don't account for that. Yeah, it was funny because we obviously first thing I should give a shout out obviously was our co my co creator Angela Luciani and talk about designs. This is Melissa. So she's uh, she's Vemus thirty three on Twitter. Uh, she writes Vemus dot net for those folks who don't already know Melissa. Uh, in fact, I got to plug her book. She actually just literally live today. Uh, if you go to itarchitectjourney dot com, she's got her new book, which will be at VMworld as well. But yeah, do you have a co- you have a co- picture a, a, a copy of it? You can hold that. I should have a, a copy handy. In fact, I said, this is what happens. I, I got to dig in somewhere around here. I've got a, I've got a copy around somewhere. Uh, I got busted without it. She's going to kill me. But anyways, uh, I, 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 you have seen it on Twitter. I've seen it on Twitter. This is now. I'm going to give it a little buzz here too. Melissa is an architect. Melissa is a designer. Her, her background is engineering, and it's well worth looking at her architectures. She's the one also the creative force behind the storyline yes. as well and comes up with the challenges. And I, all I do is say, hey, what about a security challenge in season four? Um, that was last season, you know, where, you know, something bad has happened or yeah, we, we had an attacker. <laughs> that was a big thing. And we thought what we've typically tested is people like design something. So we give them a really bizarre, you know, sort of scenario, fun and challenging scenario around hardware or software requirements, lay down the requirements, let them figure out risks, constraints, and really kind of tap into those core features of architecture. Then we went into what happens when it, part of it falls over or how do you protect it? And it started protection was really around just raw business continuity. Like we lost a whole site. How would you plan for recovery? And then what we really quickly realized, especially with your, you know, when you kind of poked in and said, hey, wait a minute, how, how are they securing this stuff? We realized we had left this huge untapped piece of architecture behind. And so with season four last year, it was really cool because we did open the doors on not just protecting, 
as far as like where do I back this thing up to and restore it from, but how do I actually protect it from pure security at every aspect? Yeah. And you know, and maybe we kind of we have a bizarre scenario of like you said, lunar bases, we've got the ISS involved, we're going to Mars, we're doing these things, but even at its very core, what we found was most of the architects and practitioners who are giving these designs, they kind of struggled with very, you know, what we as, you know, we dig into the stuff all the time, you know to look for it. So they were missing a lot of very key features of security. And I, and it maybe, they were, I want to get to you about like, they were missing what, the what did they miss? <laughs> well, they were missing the fundamentals. I mean, it's audit, it's control, it's who did what, when, where and how. That's a, basically the fundamentals of security. And if I know who did what, when, and where, and how, I can actually prevent people that shouldn't be doing things doing the wrong thing. But that's actually, even though we say that's the fundamentals, it's actually a very tough thing to do in day and age because the way we designed operating systems, the way we designed, originally designed operating systems, they're actually fairly locked down. But the way we've made things easier for the general public to use, we've loosened the controls quite a bit, and we've lost a lot of that fundamentals. You know, we wouldn't be here today having this conversation if the fundamentals were part of every architecture. VDM probably wouldn't exist if the fundamentals of data protection and data awareness and data transformation and data security were not part of everybody's mindset. And it's not. It, it really does take a specialized mindset. It can be learned. That's the key to what the, when we added the challenge in season four was to attempt to say, hey, you need to start thinking about these things. And when the people left on season four, I mean, I've had them on my podcast in the past. I, I look back a couple, um, at least, um, oh, probably about within the last 15 podcasts, we had some of the contestants from season four come in and tell us what they learned from it, specifically around security. And there's like, look, we just learned some of the more basics and it's a mindset change. And that was the original one. So season five came along and you built on season four, where season four was, hey, you went back to Earth. We have one installation. How do you protect it? There was a bad guy left on Earth. He survived. He survived. No one knows where. No one ever told me where it was, so they didn't find him, which meant he was still around. Yes. And, you know, <laughs> in every culture, there's a criminal element. He just tapped into what the criminals were doing. So you, you have to worry about that. Now you brought in, in Season 5, effectively, the Internet of Things. you got drones running all over the place. You know, this is a big deal. <laughs> You know, I don't know how many you guys were had, but I'm picturing thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of drones spreading out all over the earth. Now you basically have an IoT situation. And yeah, IoT well, security funny. is bizarre. <laughs> we we really, really we caught on early that folks were just trying to figure out just straight architecture. And it's it's really interesting how security was like the last on every list. And and even heading into the final challenge, we had three competitors that go into the final, and they go into a physical design scenario. So we use Packet.net was our, our hosting provider for it. We give them access to it. I give them very limited API access only to AWS for doing DNS updates through Route 53. So I give them a, a fairly locked down. They've got to give me SSH keys. You know, we've got to do a certain amount of handoff. So. I'm a little bit more open than I should be just to get them up and rolling because they've got a very short time. And then we kind of leave it open. And openness is really a dangerous thing because they just they just hammer ahead, right? They're trying to get it done. And then they say, then we're going to secure it. What was really cool is actually if we look at the designs that only one <coughs> of the competitors, when, when he handed it back, so Adam Post, uh, he's semi underscore technical. I tell you, the Twitter handle uh, doesn't do him justice. He is very underscore technical, if you ask me. So Adam did a great job, and he was the, when he handed me back the design, he said, I need the IP addresses of everybody who needs to get at these machines because I have to whitelist everything. And I was like, okay, we're getting better. We're getting there. Like this Somebody is, this did is cool. the right thing. And whitelisting works far better than blacklisting, and that's a great – I'm glad he did that. Yet – Inside of his design, when I read all the designs, I noticed one big thing. 
no one whitelisted the drones. Yes. Yeah. So that's... my attack vector is get take over a drone or act like a drone. I now you didn't whitelist me. I now have full access to your system. And it's funny, Bert. I mean, maybe think so. When we look at so physically, you know, he kind of he tackled security at the layer that he knew he he could directly affect it, but none of them in the designs went to like you'd figure that theoretically they would do easier than physically deploy in this very short period of time but i mean that just seems to be a gap maybe you can kind of how do people get to understand theoretical security and like what are the places they need to go because i think that was the biggest question they had and i think VDM has one failing when it comes to security and design is that you're trying to ask them to design something and then implement it. Okay, in a very short period of time. I, I when I did um when I was a judge for season four, I actually did the seasons one through four design. I didn't do the implementation. There was no way for me to do the implementation of my design because it was a design looking at, you know, interstellar distances. It was looking at, you know, how do I do updates? How do I do data protection? How do I get back and forth and in areas where you cannot breathe? You know, I need things to produce energy. I need things to produce oxygen. I need all sorts of things there. So my design was based on all that story as well as, hey, I need to think about the future. Right. I would rather see a good design than a bad design with a half a halfway decent implementation. Because the implementation of it matches the design, that's great. But no one put in they were missing the keys to security again, access control, the fundamentals, who did what, when, where and how. How do I know that was a drone or that was a person? How do I know who's sitting at the controller seat? A lot of them said, oh, and we got controls over who does what. It's like, hold it. Is there anybody even on Earth? Or are they in Mars? That's 13 minutes away by speed of light. So transmission times now come into play. It's like, I've got a long time to do a lot of damage if I'm local. They're all, this, I mean, every assumption I saw was, hey, we are local to the area. And we have available every infrastructure that's on Earth today. That's a good one, actually. We talked about this. So I love this because we f we forget about this. We talked about the idea that we lose access to Earth for a period of time. It wasn't really clearly stated how long it was. Well, but I figure about 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah, so... Something like that. Talk about that piece because I love this, this chat we had about, <laughs> about what's yeah. left. Yeah, we did this chat, and this is actually one of those things, is if you're dealing with going to, putting going, putting a data center somewhere in a climate you don't understand, 20 years is a long time. Even 10 years is a long time. Most buildings will decom pretty much decompose or be taken over by vegetation in 10 years. I mean, just walk down the town, any town, that like a ghost town, and see what's left. There's not a lot left. And, and it's relatively unsafe. And you got to remember, insects and rodents and everything like that love wires for some reason. They just love eating them. <laughs> I mean, go. I mean, I've had squirrels eat through wires in my attic. I mean, this is not good. It causes all sorts of problems in a home. But if you think about it, when there's there won't be cables running anywhere. There won't be electricity. Amazon won't exist because you got a degraded in environment of 10 years. Just look at some of the, um, there was actually some really interesting um, shows about the future if there was like no electricity, no upkeep of areas that you need to find certain supplies to survive and it would be very, very difficult. I mean, you wouldn't be yes. power at all. There was a good, was it a Discovery series or something? It was a Discovery talked, series, yeah, they talked yeah. about it. And that's what I was drawing from when I thought about that. It's like, hmm, I saw that series or parts of it, and it was really interesting. And then you read all, there's a lot of literature on this out there that it's um, eco-disasters and things like that. But when you start thinking about that, this is also what it's going to be like if you put something on the moon. You're not going to have Amazon there. There's no Amazon on the moon. There's no Amazon on Mars. You're going to have all these same problems, and when you come back, you have no idea what the environment's like. 
you may not even know if the air is even safe to breathe anymore. So people are going to be in spacesuits. They're not going to have, oh, let me plug into the latest Amazon. <laughs> Click, done. Well, I guarantee you, if there's anything left in my bad guy, which I'm not going to give where he was in season four, knew that, he would know you clicked in and would be immediately attacking your environment because you're the first new thing he's seen around the world. One day, are we, are we ever going to be able to reveal where, where the secret uh, lay? If someone can figure it out, I really think they need to think it out. But when you start thinking about the designs that I saw, a lot of them were pretty much old school. They were talking about antivirus. They were talking about endpoint computing, security. No one was really talking about securing the net virtual network or the, the overlays, software-defined networking. No one was talking about IoT security. No one was talking about, you know, you know, I have IoT, IoT as like all these drones. I have the fog, which is the drone. I have the access points, which are spread out all various areas. They, it's almost like they assumed it would be all these like, millions of drones talking to their one or two or three data centers only. It's like, no, you would be dropping other things to correlate data all around. It was, it was just too vast. As you expand further and further your drones in this world, you would end up, and it, I looked at it as this world. I didn't think about it as Earth. I thought about it as this world. You right. go to this new world that you may or may not be able to survive on. You go to drones. You're going to start in one location, build out, put another data center, build out, put another thing, build out. Eventually, you're going to say, okay, I'm going to drop an access point here and build out from there. So I now have a spider graph type thing going out. And eventually, I'll, I'll terraform or whatever the drones are doing. For they were delivering um, antivirals and stuff like that, but you know when you think about this, it's actually important stuff. And so that's why how that's to, how we do today. I mean, today is the same way. If we go back to the very basics, you know, Byron was one he brought up. He talked about how he's a big fan of just going to defense in depth. Think about yes. it. That's the first first target. What what is def I mean, because people that listen to this may be fresh to it, right? What is defense in depth, and and how does that the right place to begin? Well, the right place to begin is, is understanding defense in depth. Defense in depth means that, hey, I have a defensive wall here. You know, this is very military. -wide. Like, I have a defensive, I have my, my front line, that's the first defensive wall. Then I have a fallback position, then I have a fallback position, eventually I have the bunker. And they're all fallback positions, and effectively it says if the first wall crumbles, I go to the second one, and so forth. When I do that collapse, that type of collapsing, that's what you do in security as well, is that you hope the first wall is in breach, but if it is, I have the second wall somewhere, and then I have this third wall and so forth. Well, as our edges become more diffuse and disaggregated, those walls turn out to be very, very, very different. There is million, in, in the IoT world, there's millions of walls. There's not just one. There's millions of them. Every drone, every sensor is a wall has a wall around it, and then everything that that feeds into has its own walls, and everything internal to that has its own walls, and so forth. And I'm not talking just firewalls. I'm talking about other security controls and so forth. Again, the basics: who did what, when, where, and how, and how do I only allow the right people to do what they want to do? Effectively, what we're talking about. Uh, another. Another challenge, or I'll say it, not a failing, but another difficulty that people ran into early with everything is they went product first. So not to say that a product can't necessarily solve it, but they they worked, they picked a product and then they worked backwards from its documentation, hoping that it covered their bases. Obviously, NSX came up a lot because we got some some VR, VMware you know focused folks that were involved, and it was I as soon as I saw them lead with I'm going to use this product, I was like no no no. What are you going to do, and then where, where does the product fit well, into that capability? Well, that's the difference between architecture and design. You guys are a design. Architecture is, I have a generalized architecture that says, I'm going to need this feature, this feature, this feature, this feature. Right. And design is where I pick the products that meet those feature requirements. So you're doing a design. I'm picking the product to me is perfectly fine. If they're doing an architecture, on the other hand, they probably wouldn't. 
So the name is Design Master. It's like, okay, yeah, you've got a bunch of a bunch of products you can choose from. But the main thing is, is that know their limitations and understand how to close those gaps. For example, um, a lot of micro-segmentation, I don't care who, what form of micro-segmentation you have, whether it's VMware's, Illumino, Illumio's, um, Cloud Passages, high, uh, um, Hillstone Networks, and so forth. There's actually three or four ways to do micro-segmentation. Yeah. There is a problem in that none of the networking micro-segmentation approaches actually apply to containers. That's a big one. It's a and big one. So now you have to start thinking about, okay, and they're very limited. In, in other words, their ports and processes, their ports, not processes, their ports and IPs generally on the network. If you have some of the other ones, there are micro segmentations that look at processes. That's fine, but they're not looking at devices. They're not looking at um, device IDs. They're not looking at um, users. Is there a root user? Is there a not user? It means effectively you want to match up a bunch of stuff to make it secure. And this is kind of like a mandatory access control. I want time of day. I want geolocation. I want device right. ID. I want protocol import and IP and process. And if all seven of those match, then I'm allowed access. Now, who gives me those seven today? Almost no one. Tomorrow, a lot more companies are going to do it. Right now, you can do it with a combination of products. But when you start thinking about it like that, now you start talking about that's an architecture. You can't and just pick one. You're just like, okay, who can fit most of that? A, a good thing that I think I'd like to hear your thoughts on is as we get into disposable platforms, especially containers, right? The idea is that they spin up, tear down, so they, they'll they be gone by the time we've realized that a problem has occurred, and then it pops up on a different container, different host, different port. So it becomes much more challenging to trace back when those types of, like if an attack was happening, and it was getting through, containerized, going away, you know, spinning. How do you keep track in very volatile sort of, you know, not container is a one way to do that, but like in any volatile mi environments. Any microservice-based environments the same way, whether it's using yeah. containers or just straight software. Um, the, the When you start thinking about that one, again, it's a mindset change. It's a, it's a shift in how you think. But I, thinking about securing IoT will help you think about that. It takes a huge amount of automation and orchestration. You need to basically, as part of development, automate the security so that it registers the right thing. So it's like, okay, I'm, I'm I built and deployed a new drone or a new camera. What do I do? Well, it has to register before it leaves the barn. It probably has to register its um, device ID somewhere, right? And right. then I may have to actually instill a username in it. And now I have device and username, and then I have to make sure its GPS is working. So now I have device, username, and geolocation, and then it's ready to leave the barn. Okay, now it connects up to the network. Well, okay, I'm going to use um, network access control type approaches and say, okay, you're the right. I, I just got. I gave you your device. I know who you are. I know your username, and I know your geolocation. I'm happy with it. You can connect. You're in a well-known location, Bob. Bob's your uncle, here's a specialized ID that is just yours. Now we're starting to build more and more and more on these access controls that allow me to say, I know who you are. And the more I add, the harder it is for you to break. Now I get down the process. Let's say there's a container on the, the drones, like there could be a thousand containers on the drone based on the job they're doing. And the drone's constantly going through and like, hey, here's a container, boom, 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 boom. I'm constantly launching new ones and pulling down new ones. You don't know it and you don't care. As right. long as everything matches up, okay, the right process, the right this, the right that, this, okay, you want to talk to this process over here, it's the right one, everything else matches up, boom, you're allowed. We call that application security, and it's basically a form of mandatory access control. But in order to see the mandatory access control, you have to be in a well-known location. Hence the barn, the right. drone barn or the drone whatever you want to call it. When you start talking about that, now things expand and expand, and now you start thinking about, okay, how do I give its initial ID? 
can that be intercepted? Is that hacked? Now you get to supply chain, the supply chain security, which is now very, very interesting. And, and that's been hacked six ways a Sunday. You know, when you start thinking about all that, then it becomes a case of, okay, I need to really think outside the box. I need to start thinking about architecture. I need to start thinking about where the attack points will be. Could the drone be attacked? Oh, of course not. Well, what happens if someone gets physical hands on it and crack right. the case? Can they attack it? Of course they can't. Do you think somebody's not going to do that? Why is not the supply chain was hacked by the quote unquote criminals in this, this, this new world? in this new universe, let's say. You start thinking about that, the world changes very, very interestingly. Your thoughts on how to secure it change. So I would love to see a design master, like kind of a special one, where there is no physical part of it. Come up to right. speed and do just an architecture. And then from that architecture, do a design where you're plugging in products. Now, if you can't get that level of control that I described, and you start talking about brownfield, like you have an existing infrastructure, and now I have to layer security on, that's a whole different world. It's a different topic, <laughs> different conversation. And, and I think it's one that we all start to need to have. You know, we've we've too often gone down the road with, you know, it's funny, I just, I just saw a Twitter stream a few minutes ago uh, before we started talking about this idea of uh, N plus, you know, N plus one's not enough. Why not spend a tiny bit more and get N plus two? Like, why not buy a little more resiliency? And it's funny when we get into security stuff, it's we tend to like, well, it's going to be expensive to do it. It takes extra time. It's going to slow down the roll to production. And it just that's what breaks me. Right. I'm just like, why have we seen that this is an impediment to getting to production? It should be a requirement to go to production. And how do we change that mindset? Right. It's. By having the architects in bed, in bed security from the very beginning, it really is a case of you need to have security from the beginning. If you're asked to design or architect something, you need to add security. And if you do, you can't do it yourself because you don't have the knowledge or the experience, go to someone that does know it and get their help. I mean, that's as simple. I mean, get a mentor. They'll help you through this. This is very important stuff to get right from the beginning. If you're saying, oh, I got to revamp an existing app, it, it requires the architect to really understand that application and then get an illumination or a dependency graph from somewhere to figure out who's talking to who. And I mean, almost every micro segmentation company can give you that. Right. Then once you've got that, now I can go and revamp, look at it and say, OK, where do I need to put security and what type of security? Is it a access control layer? Is it a deception layer? In other words, I'm going to start. I'm going to throw out deceptive deception. In other words, user IDs and containers and virtual machines and whatnot. That I know that if you accessed, it's a hack. It's a it's a failsafe. It's like I may throw those out anyways to say, okay, you you broke into something that I know you should never be in and normally would never be touched. You are now in my jail. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, the new honeypots, right? Well, it actually it ends up being it's a giant deception machine. It's a honeypot, and, and doing that as a line of defense or a piece of defense is something you have to architect in from the beginning, or you can add it in as an inexpensive change to gain back more security, more knowledge, really. Because right now so we're, guess... we're faced with like millions of events. We're faced with millions of false positives. It's it's hard to get that into just one. So visibility is key. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, maybe this is a tough one to come out of the blue with, but like what are the first, what's like the top three things, like maybe places to go, things to visit, people to follow that you think people should, if they want to start getting getting closer to this? Obviously, TVP strategy, right? Yeah, obviously, <laughs> TVP strategy. Um, that actually is one of the harder questions. The best thing I would do is every RSA conference, they have something called the Innovation Sandbox. And you can see it online. You don't have to actually be at RSA conference, which had, what, 40,000 people last year or 40, 45,000 people last year. Oh, wow. It's, it's, it's I didn't huge. I the size of it. It's huge. Um, 
the innovation sandbox is usually hundreds of companies try to get into this contest. When it comes time for the RSA show, only 10 are presenting. So they will down with a lot of prejudging and stuff like that. You are given, these companies are given three minutes on stage to give to the judge panel their value prop. A little bit about the company, but mostly their value prop in three minutes. And then there's a judging that goes on. They also have 10 booths there or, or kiosks and they, they, the judges go around and get a demo. And you can as well, and you can listen to the questions, you can ask your own questions. And then there's a little bit of the audience involved as well. But what it is, is what you see is what's coming next. You don't see the, there, the, the been there, done that. You see right. what's coming next, what is important to look into according to the security community, really. So that is good to follow. If you want to go to one place to see what's coming down the pipe next and general ideas, that's a good place. It's also called the Security Bloggers Network, SBN. That's actually worth following as well. It's a bunch of security bloggers, not just me. Um, but it's, it's, it's well worth following that. It's also worth looking at some of the security reference architectures that are out there. There are very few. But if you can find them, they're usually good. And they've been peer reviewed. Everybody and their uncle's commenting on these things. And I put one together. It's a great one to start with. It does, it does mention products eventually, but it's more like you need this, 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 these general classes of pro products. And then it's like, okay, you know, this one kind of does that. But, you know, there's four ways to do micro segmentation. You need to pick from one of these four styles. How would you do that? How can you cross cloud boundaries? These become really interesting conversations. So go to the conferences and start having them. Go to your security team and start asking the questions. If you're an architect or a designer and you don't know this, go to your security team. Seriously. <laughs> yes. And if they don't want to help you, go to your management and say, look, I, I need security advice and they're not helping me. Get them to help you. I mean, it really is that simple. They should be more than willing to help you and say, you know what? You're doing the architecture. Here's what we think. That's where I you should it, start. It's better collaboration, and, and maybe there's there's been a bit of an underlying sort of fear that you know, the security group is, like, they're the ones that are going to say no to what I'm about to do. Like, then that tells you that you should collaborate with them, right? Like, we should learn from that. The reason that maybe they've said no in the past is because you continuously present flawed architectures or, like, challenged architectures. So well, collaborate early, right? Yeah, it's collaborative area. I don't want to say flawed architectures. You're presenting it in a way that they don't understand. Your language and their language are going to be very, very different. Right. If you are going to present an architecture and you do not understand your audience, you will not be able to present your architecture very well. Right. You need to speak their language. So if they ask you a question about what about or, or, you know, how do you handle mandatory access controls and you have absolutely no idea what that means, be upfront about it and ask them, like, what do you mean? What, what's this, what is mandatory access control? Or better yet, learn it beforehand so you actually do it. Go to the security, pick a security person, ask them to come over. You know, I, I have some questions about the architecture. Here it is. You know, what am I missing in my language? What am I missing that makes it not, I mean, they, they're going to have questions. You're going to have questions. It's a good time to get together. That's important. But the other thing is, is maybe find a mentor in the industry. That's another way to do this. It's like if you're not willing to go to your security team, go to somebody you trust. Say, hey, I need to get this information. What do I do? Um, or better yet, hire a third party to review it for you. So it's like seen as like a third party came in reviewed it for security and general pra practices, and they made these suggestions and made it better, and now you can present it to the rest of the company. You know, that type of thing. There's all sorts of ways to do this. There's all sorts of companies that do these things, but also remember that you need to also attack your implementations. Red White hat hackers and, and pen testing is a must these days. Yes. Yeah. Which actually, that is something no one put into their design either. Yeah, that one, uh, again, there is, I think somebody had talked about, you know, sort of a chaos monkey, chaos gorilla, you know, potential approach. 
but it wasn't really fully visited, and very certainly not in the security aspects. So well, again, actually, so in Chaos Monkey, it's not about security, it's about availability. No, no, that's it, right? You want, there's actually a security squirrel is what you want. <laughs> it actually exists, and you can get it off, off of GitHub that does all sorts of security checks. But you also need auditing. You need all sorts of things that most people don't have for config changes and config drift and things like that that you need to be aware of. And ultimately, what it boils down to is, can I do forensics? And right. forensics are asking who did what, when, where, and how, and why. If you cannot answer those questions with your log files, with your audit logs, with your security measures, with even your operational measures, then you have a problem. And that was also missing. Ultimately, you got to go, remember, if I find a security issue, ultimately it may actually go to the court of law. If it goes to the court of law, I need that. It may not always go there, but that actually is vital information for security folks as well. Yeah, having the having a camera in the corner of the room is only good if it's being recorded somewhere, right? If you don't catch it in the act, then you, you've got to have a record. Exactly. And that's the key. And then that's, I mean, what I was missing from all the, all the um, and, and I'm not going to pick on any one architecture or any one design. They weren't thinking about behavioral analytics, which because they were saying, oh, I'll do endpoint security. And basically when I think endpoint security, most people think antivirus, anti-malware. That's dead technologies. IDS, IPS, those are pretty much dead technologies. Anything that is blacklisting or um, being rule-driven, simple rule-driven, is kind of a dead technology these days. Our, 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 our attackers are smarter. So behavioral analytics or anything that looks deeper and has does second or third order analytics or machine learning on data, that's actually viable. Um, whitelisting, that would have been like incredibly important to do for the drones and the data centers. Yeah. The, these all these things become really, really important. And then it's also looking at audit trails and things of that nature because the audit trail is kind of like your fallback, your last fallback position. It's like everything else failed. Let me let me look at the audit to find out what happened. Okay, now I got the audit. And I figured out what happened. This is the forensics piece. Now I need to put in a new control or a new wall or a new security element to fix or patch that. Or I need to adjust a rule or a policy somewhere. Those are kind of the important things. I didn't see any of that in there. And I, that's what I would love to see. I had a great uh, security architect in my in my team once, and he just said, "It's I." He, someone asked him, "What's your first thought on what we should do here?" He says, "Assume you're breached," and I and I and someone said, "Well, how would you know that?" He says, "Actually, that's the question I have to ask you." <laughs> and it, it immediately made you think, like, you've got to prove me wrong. That they only have to be right once. You have to be right all the time, right? Is we need to be able to have a way to check to be assured that we haven't actually been breached and, and that's a law a big aspect of it. Well and this is a case, it's not a case of will you be breached or won't you, it's a case of when you will be breached. Yeah. And everybody's been breached. I will guarantee you that. Everybody. I mean even the most people that think they're the most secure in the world have probably been be breached. I was dealing with a customer of this was many years ago. I was much, much younger and just started it really just kind of starting in this. And I was dealing with a Unix system and someone said, oh, you know, I got contact because I, I knew Linux very, very well and I knew Unix very, very well. And they said, hey, how would I know if X? What what do you do if I you, they detected a breach? And it's like at that time, and it even still is the answer, reinstall from media. Yeah. Don't restore from backup. And the guy's going, well, we can't do that. We'll lose too much data. And it's like, look, this is the only way that I know of to ensure that the breach is gone. You know, you reinstall from media, don't attach it to anything, up, do the upgrades, get all the patches in, make sure your security controls are in place, and then connect it. It's like, you know, we're going to restore from a seven-year-old backup. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, then, you restore from a seven-year-old backup, guess what? They were hacked for over seven years and did not know it. Wow. So it's not a case of if, it's a case of when. So assume yeah. you're breached. Now tell me if you can tell me if you are. That is probably the best question your security guy could have ever asked. 
And the I C, I the, mean, the C suite's going to assume that now too. I mean, in the past to say, oh, we'll never be breached. It's like, no, <laughs> it's a case of when, not if. And the other one is a lot of folks tend to lean on, you know, I know we're, we're heading up to, to a long one, but this is all informative stuff. This is very good for me as well. Uh, you know, we talk about replication technology and that's so why like replication gets faster. It doesn't only replicate the good stuff, right? It replicates the everything. bad. It replicates <laughs> the bad stuff. So if you're hit by ransomware and you got replication, guess what? <laughs> You just replicated everything that was encrypted. Good for you. <laughs> Were you, you I mean, and then, then you start asking, okay, so how do you detect that? Um, were you using versioned rights? Hmm, don't know. Um, yeah. Could you tell me who did that? Could you actually, in the endpoint, tell me, again, if you were doing application level security that said, okay, you have to be this process in this lo geolocation, by this user and so forth, you know what? Most ransomware would fail because it creates a brand new process that isn't registered anywhere and right. tries to access things as a user that process should never be running at to access data that it should never be able to access in the first place. So is that a control? If you had that level of application security, oh yeah, this would be great, but it doesn't always work. So you gotta make sure it's because I could literally right now and most people don't understand is that like most hashes can be broken given a big enough set of data so at 10 if so if i'm using an md5 hash as part of my id all i need is a 10 meg file and some applications are bigger than 10 megs yeah i could overwrite just a small string of it and still have the same hash so multiple hashes and that's good enough for me to hack it but how would i write that in the first place how did i gain that access you know Boom, boom, boom. You start asking these questions. You keep, and that's the thing. You always ask, start with you've been breached. Okay, how was I breached? How, how can I tell I was breached? And okay, what type of breaches are there? Where can I get the audit trail to ensure that I know what happened at all times? Because ultimately, I'm going to need that to do the research. I now, love it. That's, Good lessons. <laughs> well, what we should do is a um, virtual design master season that is only security. And I think that it needs to be a, a collaborative piece because we need to learn together. I think all of us can definitely learn from that and, and watching it from the outside will be helpful. So you know, look in the future. I think we have virtual uh, virtual design master, secure, special security uh, edition may be in the works. You know, we definitely have to, to target this. This is important stuff. So it's, yeah, and it's, and it's, thank you it's for, being... for helping to lead it out too because you know, having you, you know, help out with the with season four and be a mentor to folks and being able to offer advice through it. It's been a lot of people really came back and said, hey, that was a hard lesson learned, and but I appreciate it. So it's, it's definitely good stuff. Well, thank you very much. Well, everybody, thank you very much, Eric, for being on the Virtualization and Cloud Security Roundtable podcast, episode number 200 and some odd. I think that's what it is, or it's 190 or 198 or it's close. Um, this will be coming out soon, hopefully prior to VMworld, and hopefully I'll see everybody there. I'll be speaking there on a security operations center for VMware vRealize Insight, vRealize Log Insight, which will be a lot of fun. And this is, again, visibility, so that you know, I'll have some nice little bells and whistles in it. And VDM Season 6 is in the works. Well, we we've got a we we just survived season five, and I say survived not in the storyline sense, but just survived getting through it. It's all it was it's more work than I could ever imagine just running it. But uh, we we we've got season six on the radar always, so we'll we'll, we'll be we've got a lot of planning to do. But who knows? There may be a five point five in the middle somewhere. Virtualdesignmaster.io. Everybody, go there and say hello to Angelo and um, Melissa and Eric. They do a great job. I mean, this stuff is great. If you haven't signed up for it in the past, you should. It is a lot of work. Even the judges, when I started doing my architecture for all seasons one through four, just to kind of catch up myself to figure out how I would do it, this became a really interesting work and, and, uh, and process. And I'm thinking that now I need to revamp it to introduce the drone garage. We can look forward to that one. Yeah. So anyways, thank you very much, Eric. And everybody, have a great day. Thank you.